Welcome everyone, I'm Mark David, founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating. We're back in the Psychology of Eating podcast and I am with Jane today. Welcome Jane. Hi Mark. I'm glad we're doing this and just want to let viewers know, you know, Jane and I are going to go for about 45 minutes to an hour and this is all about, you know, me asking questions and seeing if I can help you on your journey with food and body. So if you can wave your magic wand and get whatever you wanted with food, body, what would that be for you? Um, it would be a couple different things. One is lose weight. Um, another is have food and body just take up a smaller amount of consciousness. I just want to think about it less, um, have more peace. Um, and then there's also health things that I would like to resolve. Mm -hmm. And do you care to share the health issues that you want to resolve? Sure. Sure. Um, I can kind of give like a, a, a relatively abridged versions of things. So I don't dwell too long, but, um, I may or may not have PCOS. Um, I carry most of my weight in my like middle. Um, and so I've been told that um, I have like insulin resistance and should eat low carb um, and had an endocrinologist who wanted to put me on metformin and I refused. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've lost weight over the years, but it's become my body has become like more heavy in the middle, which is now having various implications for things. I also had elevated liver enzymes and a number of other weight related things that aren't horribly serious, but aren't fantastic either. Mm -hmm. So have you been officially diagnosed as diabetic or pre-diabetic? No. Interesting. Okay. And how old are you, Jane? 36. How long have you wished to lose weight? Um, so I've lost and gained weight since I was a teen. Um, I've wanted to lose for, I don't know, probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, so as, so at a certain time as a teenager, at some point you woke up one day and you said to yourself, I want to lose weight. Yes. What, what kind of like, just going back in time, can you remember what prompted that? Did you just look at your body and say, I want to lose weight? Did somebody tell you you needed to lose weight? Had you gained weight at some point past the point that you wanted to? So there's a very like particular thing that happened, which is um, odd, which is that a very, very good family friend of ours, my mom's friend was doing Weight Watchers and told us all about it and said, you know, you could do it too. And it had never really occurred to me. There were things about my body I didn't like. I was probably 14 at this point, 15. There were things about my body I didn't like, but I never, it had never occurred to me to think about how many calories are in each thing. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, I'll try it. And then it became like a game. How good can I be at mastering this game? And oh, wow, it oh, wow, it works. And then people give you attention. And, you know, so I, I lost a lot of weight doing that. But I mean, before that, it's not that I had like no body consciousness at all. I was very athletic tomboy growing up and then hit puberty early. And that was like kind of traumatic. Um, and so then when I thought I could just lose weight in general, I mean, that was better for like my, the sports that I was playing. And then, you know, better for everything, I guess. Mm -hmm. So here you are, you're this 14 year old, you lose some weight doing whatever Weight Watcher thing they were doing back then. And then at some point the weight comes back on or did it? Yeah. So when did you first notice that the weight comes back on? So the weight came back on in college when I was depressed and I think working with a therapist and processing a number of things from, you know, my childhood about my family and my parents and I don't know, being a bit rebellious and I gained 
I don't know, 30, 40 pounds. In college. I lost it before college ended. And when college ended, I was tiny, but in a way that, you know, I, I was then like had an eating disorder at that point. So too thin and, and, you know, could sometimes not eat for like a full day and, or longer. So that, that was not good. Okay. So then after college, so here you are, you're pretty thin. And then when's the next time the weight started coming back on? It started coming back on like slowly, or I would gain 10 and then lose some or, but then gain more and then lose more. Um, so it, it went up and down. Um, and then, and then I, I mean, I, after college, I was abroad, I was active. I was doing a whole bunch of stuff. So it, it nothing like I would, I would still lose it. But when I was 28, I started a PhD program where I was sitting all the time. And I think a lot of like hormonal things changed. Then that's when some of the endocrine problems started. And that's when I was gaining like about five pounds a year. So, I mean, pretty gradual, mm -hmm. um, that I eventually thought like, I'm going to go off of some medications that I thought could be contributing to it, but it was just a, a prolonged period of gaining and, and became increasingly hard to lose. Got it. So what would you be willing to share what medications you gave up that you thought might have been contributing to weight gain? Yeah. So I went off of Cymbalta. Okay. Um, I'm on Wellbutrin. I was on it before. Yes. You know, antidepressants in general, um, have a notorious side effect of weight gain or loss of sex drive. Wellbutrin's probably one of the antidepressants that's sort of best to not go down that road. Um, interesting. So are you in a relationship now? Yeah, I'm married. How long? Uh, we've been together for nine years, married for two. Any kids? No. And how does your partner feel about your body? Um, happy. I mean, I think he is bothered by the fact that I'm bothered. So if I were happy with my body, he would be happy too. Um, he's frustrated that I'm not, I haven't been able to like get where I want to go. Mm -hmm. But he's not pushing you to lose weight is what it sounds like. He's just trying to support you and what you want. Yes. yes. Okay. That's got to feel good. Yeah. I mean, he is, um, not like, like he's not skinny. Um, he is a picky eater and he knows all of that and doesn't really care. And so, I think feels in some ways responsible. Like he contributes to bringing a lot of like junk food in the house and that kind of thing. Um, but he's had his own journey and is very like comfortable with how he looks and with how I look and is like, let's everybody should just practice self-acceptance as long as you're, you know, healthy. Mm -hmm. Who, how did you get the idea that you may or may not have PCOS? For those people who don't know what that is, polycystic ovarian syndrome. How did you, how did that notion strike you? So I, I had elevated liver enzymes that were perhaps from the Cymbalta or just from weight gain or from being on an anti-malarial for two years while I did field work in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and the, you know, the, the liver doc said like, you should just lose weight. You should just walk for 30 minutes. And I said, I, I do. <laughs> you know, like I don't, I don't, you know, I eat a wide variety of foods. I'm active and I don't lose weight. So he referred me to an endocrinologist who did a whole bunch of things, a workup for PCOS, and then actually ended up finding elevated prolactin and a pituitary adenoma, which I'm currently being treated for. Um, and, and that, that endocrinologist said, you do not have PCOS. Then I moved across the country because I got a job, got a different endocrinologist 
start, started being treated for the pituitary problem. And that doctor said, yeah, you probably do have PCOS, mm-hmm. but she never told me exactly what lab values or other like criteria she was using to say that. Mm-hmm. You know, having a pituitary growth can be one of the more challenging um, positions to be in when it comes to weight loss resistance. Oftentimes what happens is people will have a, you know, a pituitary tumor of some kind and it just causes weight gain. And it'll be persistent and difficult to get rid of. I don't, I don't know that that's what's happening for you, but the fact that that's been established, that you have a pituitary adenoma, it can very well point to why you might be the kind of person who seems to do what's best for you and the weight doesn't come off. So has, has anybody mentioned that to you? Yes, um, they have, but my endocrinologist was, I mean, so I, I, I went on cabergoline to, to shrink the tumor and, um, it's now not visible on an MRI. And Ooh. so she, so sh- she also seemed to think that I could lose weight going on cabergoline. Um, and I noticed a number of changes like hormonally, but, but I didn't lose weight on it. Mm-hmm. I also wasn't making like fantastically healthy food choices either. Mm-hmm. So, so it's hard how, to tell. Yeah. How would you describe your eating these days? It just, just don't so much tell me what you eat right now, but in, in, in general, if you're looking at Jane and you're describing overall her relationship with food and kind of how she goes about feeding herself, what would you say? So I would say I um, try to put effort into thinking about what to buy and what to eat. Um, So I'll do some kind of preparation to cook something um, and work from home. So tend not to eat much in the morning Um, and then end up being really rushed and focusing a ton on work and then doing whatever's fast. Like if there's leftovers, fine. If it's a frozen burrito, fine. Um, and then for dinner with my husband, trying to figure something out that involves for me, like a lot of vegetables and something else. But sometimes at night, you know, it's like, then there's ice cream and cookies and whatever else. Got it. What time do you usually eat dinner? It varies. So, I mean, sometimes 10 p.m., sometimes 7, rarely 7. If you averaged it out, if it came to an average time, what do you think it would be? 8.30. Okay. And so after you finish dinner, you might have some cookies or ice cream in the house. Is that what you're saying? Or you, or you might have that instead of dinner? After dinner. After dinner. What time do you usually go to sleep? Mm, midnight. Midnight. So when would be the last time that you're eating anything? 11. Okay. What time you should get up? Seven. How's your sleep? Um, it goes through phases. Um, lately pretty good. I've been falling asleep and, um, staying asleep. We have a puppy, so there's, there's that, but <laughs> yeah. aside from puppy related issues, pretty good. Okay. So I'm still men- tired during the day though. Yes. So you mentioned about breakfast. Will you skip it or you just eat a small breakfast? I may eat like a bar of some kind or a banana or, you know, an apple or something like that, but, but, and coffee. And, and that's generally it. Okay. So what time would you do that? 11 or 12. Okay. So that, so that's the first thing. So when first thing that you ingest, when you wake up happens at about 11, Uh, I'll have coffee maybe at nine or 10. And then the first food will be at like 11 or 12. Okay. How many coffees per day would you say? One. 
And that's it, no energy drinks, anything like that. Okay, so coffee around nine, first food you eat is the little snacky at about 11. And then what's the next time you eat? I generally then get hungry around two, uh, two or three, I'll have lunch. Um, and it's usually pretty rushed. It's like I'm in the middle of a work thing and I just get something from the fridge. Got it. Are you, so let's say you're sitting down and eating dinner. Would you consider yourself at dinner a fast eater, a moderate eater, a slow eater? I would say moderate, moderate. Okay. Yeah. How about your husband? Slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And how's your digestion? It's pretty good. Um, I some I always am actually envious of people who say like, oh, I cut out dairy and felt all these changes because I feel like I never feel anything. <laughs> I feel like very disembodied and like I don't know how to listen for things or like something would have to be really, really, really drastic for me to even notice it. Mm -hmm. What is your, it's, it's, by the way, I'm going to be bouncing around with you as you've already okay. noticed. So you're a really good sport. Thank you. But there's a method sure. to the madness here. Yeah. Um, so what do you love to do? That's, a little more physical, it doesn't have to be super physical. What's some of the favorite things you do that give you pleasure where you sort of feel the pleasure in your body other than food? I don't know. Um, I guess like walking. Mm -hmm. Any things you do outside, any places that especially make you feel good to walk? Or is it just, just walking? Yeah, mountains, places that are beautiful. Okay, so you like nature, you like beauty. Woods, yep, yep. Um, and I guess like affection with people or with dogs or animals. Yeah. Um, but that's uh, actually hard for me. I, I feel like graduate school, I, I became like the, I went to so much school that I lost a lot of my hobbies uh, because graduate school rewards the people who like focus the most on work. And so I work a lot and I care a lot about what I do. And then I'm not very good at hobbies. Mm -hmm. Are you self-employed or are you working for somebody or some organization? I work for a university. Uh -huh. And, but you're working from home. Yeah, I teach uh, a couple days a week and then I work from home a couple days a week. And then, you know, right now it's summer. Right. Okay. You mentioned before that puberty was early for you. And, and that was, that was, you might have used the word traumatic. Um, was that because your body was just developing fast and everybody else's wasn't? How was that? How was that an intense experience for you? So it's, it was that, that I was like an early bloomer, um, which was awkward because I was so not feminine. Um, and also like I, so I have two sisters and my parents are married. My dad is a doctor, but, and, and I would say they were highly involved parents who paid a lot of attention, but still didn't see anything, um, or just oblivious to a lot of like interpersonal emotional things. And so like, I still never felt like there was any support from them or like I could talk to them about anything. And I had a very, very problematic sibling who has a number of like personality disorder issues and always like just hated me growing up. And then when I hit puberty would always say very unkind things about that, like about my body or about um, like why other people would or wouldn't like me and stuff like that. Older sibling? Yes. Okay. And same gender too. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 
you have such an interesting story, Jane. <laughs> really? I mean that. You, you, you are what any good practitioner would consider, and, and, and I say this affectionately, a complex client. Um, yeah. And the reason why I say that is that, you know, there's some things going on with your body that some we kind of know and others we're not so sure yet. And we also know like a lot of people, you started dieting at a young age and you got on that bandwagon. We also know that like a lot of people you absorbed from your environment, you know, family and others, um, just negativity about your body or disinterest in it. Or, you know, if, if as a child, we're feeling like our parents aren't really feeling us or getting us in the right way, no matter how much attention they give us, we will often feel very disembodied. That's just one way that a human will often deal with the emotional discomfort of not feeling seen and gotten or the emotional discomfort of feeling not loved or mentored by an older sibling will disembody. And, and meaning we just kind of check out a little bit. Now you manage still at a young age, you, you were still active, but it sounds like around college, even though you lost weight, that feels like a time when, you know, your relationship with food in a strange way really um, took a hit even more. Yeah, yeah. And when we have a disordered relationship with food, just in my languaging, there's a place where we, once again, we're kind of stepping outside the body. And it's hard to get back in oftentimes. It's hard to get back in. And what we end up doing, if I've stepped outside my body because life is uncomfortable or the body is uncomfortable or like, what's this body doing? How do I manage it? How do I deal with it? How do I deal with life? And all of a sudden, if you're in graduate school and you're finding yourself sitting down a lot and success equals not being in your body, success means being in your head, so you're getting rewarded for being in your head, which is understandable. It becomes even more difficult to shape shift the body. So my one of my bottom lines is that if any human being wants to lose weight, and I don't care what's behind the thing that causes the weight gain that the person wants to lose, if any human wants to lose weight, by far and away, one of the most fundamental things that needs to happen so weight loss is possible, so, so getting to your natural weight is possible, is that we have to be in the body. And we have to, you know, you have a car, you want to go somewhere. You want to go somewhere, you got to get in the car and you got to operate it. You got to really know, here's where I sit, here's where I turn the key, <laughs> here's the pedal I push. So want to get somewhere, be in the car. When we've stepped outside the body, it, there's something that happens. It's just harder to shift it. And yeah, you could do stuff to it. You can go and exercise your brains out or you can go on some kind of diet, but it won't sustain itself. So I would love to see you turn a corner and the corner I would love to see you turn is to make one of your practices. And this is going to be over time is to make one of your practices rather than focus on weight loss. So, so if this was reality television and I was going to win a hundred million dollars for helping you lose weight and I had two years to do it, here's what I would say to get my hundred million. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's what I'm saying here. So <laughs> one of the things I would, I would be encouraging you to do in that two years of time is to begin your program of embodiment. When I asked you, Hey, Jane, what is it that just gives you pleasure about being in your body? It was a little hard for you to answer that. 
And that makes sense because the body hasn't been a place of fun for you. you you've had to medicate it. You've had to try to diet it. You have to use it as a vehicle to support your mind so you can earn a living. And you were taught from a young age to not be in your body by the world. None of this is your fault. So the world kind of taught you a way to be in your body that wasn't really being in your body. So when I say embodiment, I mean starting to do things, and I mean little things that help you feel good about this body that you have right now. The whole point of losing weight is so you can be happier. Yeah, you'll be healthier, but you want to be happier. Right. So, and if you're healthier, you're happier. So the whole point of losing weight is to be happy. And it is very difficult to go on a weight loss journey and end up in happiness if the journey I am taking is filled with kind of pushing myself or just like trying to fix myself or not really loving on or liking on the body I have right now because it's not the body I want. Like when is this, when is this thing going to change? And when it changes, I'll be better. So there's a, there's a, there's an alchemy. There's a magic that happens when we re-enter the body without conditions, meaning, okay, you want to lose weight. I get it. I want to help you get there. Step number one is what makes you feel good about life in a body, getting out in nature. How do you do that more? Really being present to yourself when you're with your puppy, because puppies, dogs embody us if we let them. They're playful creatures. Like be like your puppy. <laughs> like really get a little puppy medicine from your dog. It's, they are just, they are just so happy to be touched. They're happy to be alive and they just want to do stuff that makes them feel good. Even eating for you, eating feels like it's not really pleasurable for you until after dinner. Yeah. When you get to eat something sweet, that's when I'm guessing food feels best to you. It doesn't feel like, like nobody just goes crazy over eating a bar at breakfast. Um, it doesn't like, you know, throw us into like great pleasure and wow, I just can't wait to have my bar. I'm assuming, um, you know, frozen burrito, whatever, fine. You know, it's, it's really, you're, you're, you're fueling yourself during the day. Sounds like you're trying to eat a little more healthy at dinner, perhaps. So think to yourself, okay, got a little more time. Let me try to do something healthy. And then afterwards, finally, when your day is like fully over, you want some pleasure. You want something sweet. So that makes sense to me. So what I'm hearing in the snapshot of your day is, and, and this is a lot of people, I complain about the same thing for myself because um, I'm oftentimes sitting at the computer a lot. And a lot of times my embodiment doesn't begin until the end of my workday. And the question becomes, I would love for you to create an inventory and we can call it a pleasure and nourishment inventory. This is your homework assignment. Your okay. teacher. You, you, you understand homework very well. Yeah. Uh, so create a pleasure and nourishment inventory. Write down an exhaustive list. Persons, places, things, thoughts, feelings, beliefs, foods, substances, experiences, anything that nourishes you or makes you feel pleasured. It could be a bath. It could be a shower. It could be kissing. It could be anything. It could be your favorite face cream that you put on. I, like everything that gives you pleasure and really embark on your program of how do you incorporate those things more during your day? Okay. Can you take a break every hour and a half, put on your favorite music and just move a little bit? like nobody's watching kind of movement. Anything that gets you in your body and begins to give you the signal that says, Jane, it's cool to be in your body. It's safe to be in your body. And it's 
fine to have some fun. The reason why I asked you about what you shared early on about puberty is that for a lot of human, so, so puberty is a powerful um, inflection point in the growth of a human being. Puberty is, is a time where psychologists will say we are profoundly imprint vulnerable because you're going from a child to all of a sudden your hormonal picture changes, your body changes. We don't know, you don't know what the hell is going on. And you're just along for the ride. Maybe guys are noticing you, maybe, maybe like the whole sexual thing all of a sudden starts to get a little closer to you. And on top of that, a sibling is not being nice to you about your body and its changes. So at a time when you are very vulnerable because your body is in this transformation stage, in an ideal universe, you would have lots of wonderful mentoring at that, at that stage. Somebody would be busy telling you, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you're beautiful. Here's what it's like, Jane, to go through this transition. It's gonna be wild, it's gonna be crazy. You know, and you might find yourself attracted to people. You might find people attracted to you. You might find that you're, unc whatever it is. And because a lot of people don't get that, maybe most people don't get that. What happens is if puberty is a very difficult ride, one of the things we often do is we'll shut down and protect. And protection might mean I'm protecting myself against the opposite sex. I'm protecting myself against my own body and its, and its changes and its desires. So in a lot of ways, one of your jobs is to kind of redo <laughs> puberty in a certain way, is to redo the part of your life where okay, I'm coming into my body now in a whole different way. But because you're a mature woman now, you've learned a few things. You're safe. You're married to somebody who loves you. You're married to somebody who looks at you and says, you're fine the way you are. Let's just self-accept and have a good time. That's some pretty good progress right there. You attracted the right person. And in a lot of ways, to me, he's a great teacher for you because, you know, sometimes if we can't love our own body, it's good to get a little help from the outside. He's also the most embodied person I've ever encountered. Like he'll stretch for like two hours every night and just mm -hmm. feel things and, and like massage and yoga and all kinds of things. So he'll help me like with that kind of thing. But I just, he has an intuitive like body wisdom thing that I just don't have. Agree. And, 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 and you don't have it because you didn't get a chance to develop it properly. Right. It is seated inside you. It is seated inside every one of us. We all have a relationship with our body that is actually very close. Nobody knows your body better than you. Second, probably your husband, but, but because you're in your body, you're the one that knows it the best. And, you know, even when you mentioned to me, you know, I asked you, how's your digestion? And you started, you know, you, you, you said it was good. And then you went off on a slight tangent and said, you know, like people can go on these diets and feel all these things and go gluten or dairy free, whatever. And I don't feel that. And what I hear when you say that is that there, there's body signals happening. There are body signals happening for you. And you're correct, you're not hearing them, but it doesn't mean that they're not happening. So the way you and I learn that language is by taking baby steps. So it's, it's literal baby steps. Your husband, by the way, tell him I said he's a great guy. Um, and he can be a really helpful resource for you here. You don't have to lie on the floor and stretch for two hours. Do it for 15 minutes. Okay. Literally, like take a baby step. Do what's doable for you. You don't have to do that for two hours. If 10 minutes is your max, I am so happy for you because it's 10 minutes where you're practicing being in your body and practicing listening to yourself. 
when you're taking a walk out in nature, that's probably one of the best places for you to see how much body wisdom you have. Because when, when you said you like to walk and I, like, and I said, where, anywhere, oh, you said, oh no, out in nature, in the mountains. And you really lit up because you connect with nature and it speaks to you. And it speaks to you because it's speaking to your body. It's, it's speaking to your senses. So your body means your senses, all five senses and every other sense that we don't know about. So anything that helps you get into your senses and just notice your moments of joy when you're walking outside and you see a beautiful tree or you feel good in the sun. I just notice it. You go, ah, that feels so good. That's embodiment. And that's teaching you how to, it's teaching your body just how to start to make connections. So we're talking about me winning my hundred million dollars. Here's another piece that I would like to see you do. And this is where you can, everything is about creating a foundation. If, if we wish to lose weight, what are the foundational pieces that need to happen? We need to be moving more and more into our body. So you and I have talked about that a little bit. The next thing is I would love to see you set up your eating such that it puts you in a better position to experience your relationship with food in an embodied way. Here is what I mean. Right now, the way you do food is... It's a slight inconvenience for you. You're working it into your work schedule. And what I would love to see you do is create a rhythm around food. One of the key aspects of being in a body is getting connected to our own rhythms. I asked you about sleep. Waking and sleeping is a rhythm. Work and play is a rhythm. You know, your monthly period is a rhythm. We're very rhythmic creatures. Your heart beats to a rhythm. Your brain waves have a rhythm to it. So your eating naturally wants to have a rhythm to it. All animals in nature have a certain rhythm to their eating patterns. So in general, and I'm saying general, this is not for every human being, but I'm going to say for most human beings, if you want to help them with their various eating challenges, get them on a good rhythm. Because once we start to get a little bit of rhythm going, things start to work a little better. When you have a good waking, sleeping rhythm, just life is better. When your period is, is, is right, life is better. So I would love to see you have a regular breakfast, regular lunch, regular dinner, and I want to see if you can gradually practice pushing the times back so you're not eating so late for your dinner and you're not eating so late for your breakfast. And I'm going to even say lunch. Reason why is metabolically speaking, for a majority of human beings, the way we're designed is our metabolic efficiency, our calorie burning capacity, our digestive capacity, strongest right around midday, high noon. 12 to 1.30. That's when we pulverize food the best. When you wake up in the morning, one of the reasons you're not so hungry is because you're eating late at night. It's your body's waking up in the morning. I don't need food because you were doing a lot of digesting and assimilating at night. So by beginning to eat a regular earlier breakfast, I would love to see you. Also what's happening, a lot of people that just do caffeine only breakfast, so yeah, I know you're doing an 11 a.m. breakfast, but basically from the time you wake up till 11, you're running on caffeine and whatever else you put in there, sugar, I don't know, doesn't matter, but, but you're basically running on chemical energy. Gives us a false metabolism. Yeah, it gives you energy, but it, it's not really priming the pump called eat, digest, assimilate, calorie burn and then start to cycle over again. So ideal universe, I would want you to have a breakfast 8, 8.30 a.m. Have your coffee first and then have some kind of breakfast. And prefer for you, now I know there's all kinds of systems, 
and different ways to do it. But to me, for you, for you specifically, I would want to see you have a slightly more robust breakfast, a breakfast that's a little bit more geared towards higher protein, higher fat. Okay. There's a ton of research out there showing that when we have a pure carbohydrate breakfast, just oatmeal, just breakfast cereal, um, a Danish, a muffin, you have a pure carbohydrate breakfast, we'll tend to crave carbohydrates throughout the day and until we go to sleep. It just sets us up for a carb craving cycle. So, you know, eggs, any kind of meat, I don't care, any kind of fish, any kind of yogurts, uh, you know, a smoothie that has some protein and healthy fat in it. And then see if you can shift your lunch to 12, one. And as a form of embodiment. So this is embodiment. This is you. So I'm just, I, I am being your de facto body wisdom right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so that's, that's kind of my job. I'm, I'm trying to tune into your body and say, hey, Jane, you know, I've been studying bodies for years because that's my weird obsession um, and, and what fuels them and what feeds them, what nourishes them and what helps them do things best because of my own health issues growing up. So your body wants a rhythm and your body wants a relationship with food that's really nourishing you because right now food is a little bit the, a little bit the enemy for you because food makes me fat. And somehow if I can figure out the food thing and eat less of it or eat the right way or whatever it is, then I'm gonna lose weight. And strangely enough, because you're not eating enough food during the first, really, I'm gonna say almost three quarters of your day, particularly when you're having a late dinner. So for the first, at least three quarters of your day, you are calorie deficient you are energy deficient, you are nutritionally deficient. You are we, are, we are creatures of the day. We're hunting, we're gathering, we're doing our stuff. I get it that we're sitting at our desks, but it's the daytime when we need food, we need nutrition. So what's happening is your body is going through a day and is basically saying, where the hell is my food? Where the hell is my nutrition? Where the, where the heck is the fuel that I'm going to burn calories from. So your body, my strong guess is noticing that it's a little starving during the day, even though it might not feel that way to you because your body signals aren't quite clear for you. So what happens is when the body notices there's not enough fuel here, there's not enough calories to burn here, it'll slow down calorie burning capacity. It's literally a built-in survival response because your body's thinking that you're on a desert island. So if there's no food, the first thing the body does, if you're on a desert island or there's a famine, your body goes, whoa, this is bad. Slow down calorie burning capacity. Store fat. Don't build muscle. Building muscle takes a lot of energy. Fat's a good storage for, for energy and nutrition. And then what happens is you're eating the bulk of your calories in the last quarter, last fifth of your day. Our calorie burning capacity is slowest in the evening time and the late evening time, early morning hours, but it gets slower after about 6 p.m. So you're, you're eating the bulk of your calories in your least waking hours of calorie burning efficiency. So I would bet a million dollars that if you shifted to the kind of diet I'm saying where you're eating a more robust breakfast, I wish for you to have a more robust lunch. Like literally, I, Jane, am going to affirm that I need to take a 20 minute break at lunchtime and I'm gonna make food or I'm gonna have a meal planned for myself that's a little bit better than just like grab and go. So something that's more of a sit down lunch, like if you were going somewhere with your friends on the weekend and you were choosing a decent place to eat, something that, that gives you a little bit more sense of, oh, this is, this is what we do at lunch. I don't even care what it is for you. Something healthy that you like, something moderately healthy that you like. 
what you'll notice is, and then I would love to see you have an earlier dinner. I would love, love, love to see dinner get pushed back e even to seven, even if you could do 730. <laughs> but at an earlier hour, and what you're going to notice is by the time you get to dinner, you will be, you might be less hungry. I'm not sure for you. Um, when you do eat dinner, what's your, what's your hunger level before dinner? I generally start snacking, uh, like maybe around five. So I might have like a handful of cashews or something if I'm hungry then. Um, so it, it depends how much snacking I do, but I'm generally pretty hungry by dinner. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So what's happening? And, and but snacks to me are fine, just so you know. Um, the way you're using snacks is you haven't had enough calories during the day, you're hungry by five makes perfect sense. So you're gonna eat something to hold you off <laughs> until dinner, which is still fine. But if we, once again, we're moving breakfast earlier, we're moving lunch a little bit earlier, we're making those two meals more robust, you can still have a snack, but it's gonna to start to modulate your appetite better in the style of eating that I'm recommending. And what I would love for you to do is, you know, if, if from a weight loss perspective, of course, I would want you eating less after your dinner meal. I'm going to say don't not do dessert. Do dessert, but I just want to make sure for you that you do the practice called if you're going to eat dessert, eat it slow and enjoy the hell out of it. That means you're embodied. You're receiving pleasure from it. I don't know where you are when you do desserts at night, but a lot of times people will just go into automatic pilot. It's easy to just kind of eat and not really be present to the food, which will make us want to eat more. If I eat and I'm not present to my meal, especially if it's something that you love, especially if it's cookies, ice cream, whatever dessert you like, the less present you are, the less satiated you will feel. And the more you'll have to eat to feel the satiation because your body's wanting pleasure. Pleasure starts on your tongue. Pleasure starts just up here with your awareness, the smells, the taste, the chewing, and you being present like, oh, wow, I love this. This is good. So I want you to, I want you to love the food you eat, not just the dessert, all of it. Right. Right. So to me, if you do these two things that I'm mentioning, start on your program of embodiment, get your husband to coach you a little bit, do your inventory of nourishment and pleasure, all the th little things, medium things, big things, persons, places, things, thought, thoughts, experiences, foods, anything that makes you feel good. And then you look at that list and you start to see what could I do every day? What could I do for five minutes? And to start to take 15 minute breaks throughout your day where you do something that is just about Jane being in her body and enjoying the moment. And then on top of that, create a rhythm with eating. See what, what happens is because you never, you, you never found a rhythm with your own body. Gain weight, lose it, gain it, lose it, whatever. Healthy, you know, the relationship with food not being good for you. And so you've never found a place where there's just a rhythm where you get up in the morning, you have breakfast, you work, you take a break, you have lunch, you enjoy it. It sustains you. You have an afternoon snack. You have an earlier dinner. You're present to it. You're taking moments during the day to remind yourself, like, this is me. I got a body and I got to tend to it in little ways. That to me will, will position you for weight loss. Okay. So... I've been talking a lot, but I just wanted to 
really just kind of download as much as I can in the short amount of time that we have, you know, of course there's always more to the equation, but, but this is, to me, it's a lot what I've just shared. And I'm just wondering, how's it, how's it, how's it landing for you? How does it feel? Makes sense. Does it make sense? It makes sense. It's, um, I mean, I wanted a deeper understanding of what I think the key issues are, but then I also wanted things I can actually do going forward. So I think there's, I have both, um, the rhythm thing resonates with me a lot. It sounds peaceful. Like who wouldn't want to try to cultivate that? Mm -hmm. Um, so that I find exciting and like, I don't, I don't know how hard it will be, but I'm excited to find out. Oh, good for you. And sometimes it's hard creating a new habit. It takes, it just takes work. So think of it as a practice, no different from picking up a musical instrument, no different from learning a new field that you know nothing about. The first time you're learning it, you know nothing, you're a beginner and things get easier after a certain point. So let's assume that it's not always gonna be easy, but that's okay because this is you learning how to get in your body. I wanna point something out to you that, that, that I also personally find compelling. Um, to me, I believe that there's a connection between how you experienced your parents holding and embracing you just energetically, emotionally. There's a connection between how you experienced that and now how you experience your own body. Meaning, and I'm paraphrasing you, um, you described your relationship with your parents saying like, yeah, they were there. They were, they were, they were, they did stuff. They were present. They probably were doing what they thought was best, but they missed this whole thing. And this thing that they missed was sort of me <laughs> and what I needed. Now, what happens is, and forgive me for stating the obvious, but oftentimes we will, we will interject that. We will take that experience and make it our own. Well, if that's the way the big people of the world who are most important to me relate to me, then that's how I'm going to relate to me. And so you're there for yourself. You've educated yourself, you've worked hard, so you've done things for yourself. You found a good relationship. You, you, you are making your life work to the best of your ability. You're a functional human being. And at the same time, there's this part of you that doesn't get you. When you say like, well, I don't, I don't know that part of my body. I don't get those signals. I don't feel those things. That's, that's you just, you haven't learned how to notice that part of you just like your parents never learned to notice a certain part of you. Right. you. See the connection that I'm making? Yeah, it's it's not lost on me that they were so focused also on my mind. And that's the part of me that I feel like I know how to work and use. Yeah, yeah, you do. And congratulations, because not a lot of people do that well. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, good for you. And... And now this is a time in your life to get your PhD in Jane's embodiment. And, you know, a PhD doesn't happen in a week or a month or a year for that matter. So, so this is your post, this is your doctoral training in getting to know your body um, in a whole different way. And, it's a different way than we get to know our minds. Because the mind you have to harness, the mind you, you have to point it in a direction. The mind is like a tool and you have to learn how to use that tool and you direct the tool. So our mind is most efficient when we're telling it what to do and it does it. Hey mind, study. Hey mind, show up for work. Hey mind, say smart things that'll help people. With the body, in many ways, we have to notice and listen to it. You can't just tell the body what to do. I mean, you can, but you can't just tell it anything to do. You have to listen to the body and start to, start to notice what it is and what it wants 
and what it's asking for, what it's hungry for. And that takes a little practice. It's just like, you know, the first time you get to know, first time you went out on a date with your husband, you know, you're getting to know the guy. You don't know him. So you just pay attention, you listen, you ask some questions, you try a few things. So, so to me, this is, this is um, an inflection point in your life where it's not about fixing your body. Now, I get it that there's medical concerns and you address those medical concerns. But in my mind, it's not that your body is broken and we need to fix it. Bodies go through stuff all the time. Whether people need to lose weight or not or wanna lose weight or not. So bodies are always, the healthiest people get health issues. You could have the best diet in the universe. You could be exercising better than anybody and have your health issues. So all I'm saying is that your road to weight loss doesn't mean you have to fix a broken body. That's like a small piece of the puzzle, addressing health issues. Fundamental issue is getting back into the body, training yourself to be connected to your body, enjoying it, nourishing it, feeling pleasure with it, accessing your body wisdom more, just landing in it. And the other piece is beginning to nourish yourself in a rhythmic way and notice the results, notice how you feel. So it's an experiment, but I'm suggesting with the rhythmic eating that I mentioned to you, uh, literally think of this as your, it's a, it's a personal experiment. Let's try this and see what happens. So it's very scientific in that way. And, and you got to give it enough time. That's why I suggested a couple of months at least. Um, and, and you'll, you'll certainly notice a difference. Okay. Okay. And I've got a, just a lot of hope for you because you have what it takes. Thank you. Yeah. You're so I'm welcome. Excited. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. It's been a treat. Thank you so much. Yes. And is there anything else before we finish that you're taking away from this conversation that we haven't mentioned yet that just landed for you or just sort of stuck for you? Um, that how I eat is as or more important than what I eat. Like you haven't told me do or don't eat a lot of specific things. Um, so I'm going to focus on the how and the rhythm um, and see what happens. Great. Yes, because too much nutrition information at this point, I think is just going to be mind clutter and it's going to take you away from where I think the real action is right now. Right now, the action is get on a rhythm. I almost don't care what you eat per se. You know, I mentioned some ideas about breakfast. Right. You know what a healthy lunch for you or a healthy dinner looks like. I didn't say don't eat dessert. I just said be present, <laughs> slow down, enjoy it. Right, right. So letting go of all the shoulds and shouldn'ts around the what that you eat. So I'm... Um, I'm glad that landed for you. I'm glad that that um, stuck for you. And yeah. again, good luck to you. I, I think this is going to work for you. Thank you. Me too. I really appreciate it. Same here. Thanks, All right. Jane. All right. Take care. And thanks, everybody. Take care now. Hey, friends. We're so happy that you've joined us for another episode of The Psychology of Eating with Mark David. Are you loving these episodes? Then simply subscribe and you'll never miss an episode again. We'd also love it if you'd leave us a comment below so we can hear more about your own journey with food and body. And if you're curious about what we offer at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, including our internationally acclaimed coach certification training that's rooted in dynamic eating psychology and mind-body nutrition, please head on over to our website, psychologyofeating.com. Until next time, 
take care and remember having the body you want starts with loving the body you have